Good morning. Welcome to Tri-City Baptist Church this morning. It's so good to have you out with us. What a beautiful day it is outside with the snow. Our Lord knows exactly what we need for moisture as he builds that snowpack. And we get just enough snow to water things down, but not hinder us from being at church. So it's good to see each and every one of you out this day. And for those of you joining us online, good, to, good for you to be with us as well. We appreciate you join us in this time of worship this morning. Uh, let me welcome each of you as I look around, uh, looking for any visitors. If this is a first time visit for you, or maybe the first time in a long time, we'd love to welcome you here to Tri-City Baptist Church, and we'd love to acknowledge your visit. In the seat near you, in one of the back pockets, you'll see our connection cards. We'd ask that you would take a moment and fill those out. And then you can turn those in at the Welcome Center. We have a gift for you uh, just to say thank you for being with us this day. And you can learn a little bit more about uh, ministries here at Tri-City Baptist Church. Also for our church family, we utilize those in the office for prayer requests or any other information that you would like the uh, pastoral staff and support staff to be aware of. So if you'd fill those out and you can drop those in uh, the giving box outside or drop them off at the Welcome Center, we'd appreciate that as well. Each Sunday morning at 9.30 during our Adult Bible Fellowship Hour, uh, we have what's called a heart class. And it is a class that introduces uh, you to Tri-City Baptist Church and our ministries throughout the semester. You have opportunity to meet uh, members of the pastoral staff as we go over various responsibilities that we have. Uh, our chairman of the deacons will be in, our finance, uh, uh, our treasurer will be there speaking of finances and and uh, it's a tremendous opportunity. So at 930 in the study, pastor study behind the auditorium here, we'd love to have you join us on Sunday mornings. Please take note, church family especially, uh, every other week on Tuesday, we have a community-wide food bank, food uh, a drive-through food bank. Uh, but on each Monday, our volunteers come together to minister specifically to our church family. So if you take note of that, it's a drive-through as well, but take advantage of that. Uh, it's a tremendous opportunity to meet uh, food needs and sometimes there's other healthcare needs and et cetera that's available. Uh, we are in need of a Sunday school secretary. We've been, about, uh, been without one for a period of time. If you are interested, this is not an overwhelming task, but we'd love to have someone who would uh, like to help keep track of our numbers and, and uh, attendances and some administrative items with our Sunday schools. Uh, our Sunday school primarily deals with our children, but there's also some things with Adult Bible Fellowship that you can help us out with. Uh, with tracking that. So if you have an interest in that, contact me. Feel free to contact me or reach out to Debbie Fleming or just make contact at the church office and we'll follow up with you. In a moment, uh, Pastor Larry, uh, in just a few moments, will come up and speak a little bit more towards grief share. Uh, we are beginning to offer grief share. These are uh, on next Sunday evening at 6 p.m. And I'll let Pastor Larry deal uh, address that a little more thoroughly in a moment, but it is for those who have experienced a loss in the family, a loss of a loved one, loss of someone near uh, to you, and how to deal with that uh, biblically. Let me uh, reintroduce us to Josh and Rebecca Miller. Uh, they are missionaries serving in Utah. I've known Josh since he was just a little lad. I had, I had the opportunity to teach him. I don't remember if it was as a uh, one of our younger children or if it was when he was in his junior high, high school age. Uh, but what a fine young man this is. He and his wife have been serving in Utah for a number of years. Let me just share some of their praises. Members at Grace Church are demonstrating wonderful unity in spite of difficulties. Uh, much like us, as you can see, they're dealing with uh, COVID restrictions, but they've been able to average on a pretty much a weekly basis around 60 folks, whether that be in person, on site, or via Zoom online, much like we're doing. So do pray for that ministry as they continue to have outreach into um, 
this Mormon community. What a blessing it is to have a church there. It's called Valley of Grace Church. Josh has been able to uh, teach in small groups. They call them grace groups. He's been teaching through First and Second John this past year, completed that. He also has completed a preaching study of the life of David from the book of Psalms. And so pray for that ministry as they continue on. Uh, they do have some prayer requests, a couple prayer requests listed here. Uh, Rebecca, for many years, has had some health issues, so please continue uh, to pray for her. She's not able to be as engaged with the church family, but is able to be online uh, in that way. They also have a son. She homeschools the son, so just, just pray for her. Pray for her ability to assist in the ministry there. They also have an intern named Andrew Stevens. He is a senior at Appalachian Bible College. He'll be, he has returned to school, be graduating uh, this spring, following the spring semester. So do pray for Andrew, pray for his next steps of ministry, and let's just be in prayer for Josh and Rebecca Miller at uh, Valley of Grace Church. This time I'll ask Pastor Larry to come and, and give us an update on Grief Share. As Pastor Skip has already mentioned, we are restarting another group for our Grief Share uh, ministry. I just want to emphasize once again the purpose and, and uh, uh, goals for why we have a Grief Share ministry. Why that might be somewhat obvious uh, to you, it is uh, specifically to help those who are navigating through the process of losing a, a loved one. Uh, but uh, some of the areas that may not be quite as appropriate is this, I guess the theme today is dealing with with dogs today or whatever in the service as pastor will be coming in just a bit you saw there in your bulletin but uh in any case uh there, there certainly is in losing a, a a dear pet may be like a family member to you i understand that or perhaps going through a difficult divorce there's certainly trauma that's involved in going through those circumstances those events in your life but grief share is not really designed to deal with those specific losses but rather the loss of a a, a loved a family member and it might be recently or maybe some time ago but we can help navigate this pro uh, program is designed to help navigate through uh the process uh, bringing you back to a place of, of joy. Um, right now, we have uh, about uh, four different groups that we're, I'm involved with, with Grief Share right now. Uh, Margaret Tutton, she's over here. She's doing a grief at her uh, a, 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 a group at her facility uh, where she lives. I guess she had four this last week there, and she's continuing to do that ministry there. Uh, in Longmont, I'm actually doing one with uh, a couple of men. Uh, in Longmont, uh, there on Wednesday mornings, uh, we'll begin a new group here next Sunday night, a larger group here. We'll meet in the pastor's study at six o'clock. Uh, we are, already have one person outside of our church uh, logged in and has joined, uh, plan to be here next week. Uh, a couple from outside of our church are planning to be here. Uh, but uh, uh, then next, actually tonight, I'm helping uh, uh, Faith Point Baptist Church in Longmont get their group, a new group started tonight. So I'll be there to help them kick that off. And get that going. But if you would continue to pray for the Grief Share Ministry, it is very evangelistic and has a great outreach to our community and meets a lot of needs there. It will be next uh, Sunday night, as, as mentioned there, it's in your bulletin, six o'clock here, we'll meeting the pastor's study. There is a sign up sheet uh, for Grief Share there on the table in the lobby, or there's also one in the office. You can call during the week. You can actually uh, register online as well for griefshare.org. And you can find it, the information there. And so please uh, uh, sign up for that. And we'll look forward to starting a group on next Sunday. Let's go ahead and begin with a word of prayer as we open our service now. Let's pray together. Our Father, we do rejoice and thank you for your rich blessing in our lives. Lord, what a privilege to uh, be a servant of you in the day and age in which we live. Uh, when we see the spiritual battles all around us. Uh, we pray that you'd strengthen us, encourage us today from your word. And we thank you for the ministries that we're able to participate in, whether it be Grief Share or the Food Bank Ministry or, or so many other different ministries with the Music Academy, the Iwana Program, Teen Ministry, and, and so many others. We thank you for those opportunities. 
And we pray that we'd be busy about reaching out to those around us with individual Bible studies and with uh, different uh, uh, times when we can pass and deliver uh, tracts to people and share with them the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But to now during this time, Lord, we ask that you bless us as we, first of all, worship you collectively all together and offer our sacrifice of praise and worship. And then as we hear our pastor come with a preaching of your word, fill him and use him today. Bless the service now we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in spite of all the uncertainty that fills our world, I know we have anxieties that we bring into a Sunday morning service about everything from politics to finance to illness. There is one thing that is among the most certain truths is that God is on the throne and he continues to reign. Rejoice, the Lord is king. So lift up your voices and sing this morning as we stand together, hymn 43, Rejoice, the Lord is king. Rejoice, the Lord is King, your Lord and King adore. Rejoice, give thanks and sing and triumph evermore. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say. Seat upon, lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again. I say, rejoice. This kingdom cannot fail. He rules over earth and hell. The keys of death and hell are to His kingdom cannot fail. You know, there are people scattered all over the earth today obeying the Great Commission to take the gospel where people have never heard. Um, I mentioned to Pastor that some of my friends are in a land called Myanmar, Burma, formerly. And one of their primary goals is to go, even within a land that has had the gospel for many, many years, there are complete sections with no one knowing or ever even hearing of the name of Jesus Christ. And so uh, let's remember to keep our brothers and sisters in Christ in prayer. That land is under great and horrible, violent takeover by the military, and the gospel is at risk, if you would pray for them. But perhaps there are those of us who have also decided that perhaps God is calling us to do more, to take another step in doing more for the spread of the gospel overseas. You know, there is giving, there's praying, there's going. And whatever area God may be speaking to you, I trust this, this song will be your willing offering of yourself. Here I am, Lord. I, the Lord of sea and sky, I have heard my
It's a familiar old story, but an amazing one. When you think of the grip that Satan has on the lives of people, the Bible says he blinds the minds and the eyes of those who do not believe, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ would penetrate. But there's a wonderful story of a man who was a slave trader, and you know the old story. As John Newton heard the gospel, received Christ, and he who once sold slaves now delivered them from the power of darkness. He once was blind, but now he sees, and for many of you, that's your testimony, right? Jesus broke through. God did something amazing in your life, and he brought you to Christ. Let's sing it from our hearts. Our last verse, we'll lift it up just a little higher and sing it a little bit louder when we've been there 10,000 years. seated. You may be seated. One of the things you're going to wish for at the end of today's message is a little hope. 
<laughs> right, Pastor. And there's a great deal of hope in the scriptures. One of the things that we know is that this world is not our home. As the songwriter said, we're just passing through. We learn in the book of Hebrews, we don't have a continuing dwelling place here, but we seek one to come. But while we're down here, we need guidance. We've got to work through the potholes and the minds uh, that living in a sinful world has. And so Jewel will be playing for us today, ministering to us in song, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. Amen. Thank you so much. I love that that hymn. It goes back quite a quite a number of years, actually, uh, to the time of William Carey. If you go back to the original words to that song, it had William Carey's name in it in the first stanza, and it was a song used to um, encourage uh, that mission trip. It was a, a novel idea, a modern era, for uh, a person to leave one country and go and serve in another as a missionary. So usually William Carey is known as the father of modern missions, and that song was used uh, at that time period in history. Uh, Carey would get on uh, the boat, and he was liberated as he was heading to India. Uh, he wore a wig that was very common for English people, and he took his wig, wig and threw it into the ocean, and he was set free to, to, to a new start uh, to serve there and did a, an amazing work. Thank you so much. This morning, we're going to talk about dumb dogs. Last week, we uh, took a break from Isaiah, and we uh, went into some mush from Song of Solomon on Valentine's Day. Hopefully, that was an encouragement uh, to you folks uh, who are in love or should be in love. Uh, this week, it's going to be a, a dog theme. So dogs in our home are, are very close to our hearts right now. We just purchased a, a dog, and so that is our more recent grandson, that's Wyatt James' son, our middle son, uh, Jim and Becky's uh, second child, and that's our, our golden pyridoodle, and his name is Kenosa, so that's a hybrid name. Um, it's a Chippewa Indian name and an old Spanish word put together, so it's a made-up word, basically. Uh, Kenosa, the place of the bear. So uh, my message is on dogs. Uh, for those who wonder what a golden pyridoodle is, first uh, in that dog is a little bit of a golden retriever. So the retrievers are often known as one of the friendliest dogs out there. They like to retrieve. So right now, Dan brought us a box of tennis balls and we can throw things out and he'll retrieve it quite naturally, instinctively. So there's a portion of retriever in a Kenosa. 
Uh, the selling point to my wife was uh, that he has great Pyrenees in him, this nice little lap dog. Um, and that's how he looks. Uh, the colorings, the markings are very similar to, to that guy there. The tail is different though. I'll get to the tail in just a moment. Uh, but the great Pyrenees, uh, they basically can be traced back to the Pyrenee Mountains, the mountain range between Spain and France. Uh, during the American Revolutionary War, General Lafayette, the Frenchman, one of our allies, uh, brought the Great Pyrenees to America. So we were indebted to him. Uh, they are a shepherd dog. They love the mountains. They like being on high ground. They look over the sheep. They look over the, the shepherds. And uh, they're very instinctively protective, very loyal dogs. And um, they love the cuddle. So Canosa is very, very affectionate. And... Um, he likes to chew a lot right now. And then um, you have this side of Kenosa. His father was a, a, a full-size standard poodle. So the poodle, um, what do you say about a poodle? <laughs> so the most, most hypoallergenic of all the uh, breeds, all the coated breeds of dogs, um, they don't shed much. So those are selling points to us. Uh, very elegant, as you can see there, energetic, athletic, and they have a, a springy gait. When you see them walk, their gait is really springy. And so our dog walks like a poodle, and you see that ridiculous tail. Uh, Canosa has a tail just like the poodle. So we have a golden Pira doodle. So our family has been um, very much fixated on dogs, and it's great to come to a passage here in Isaiah 56 that speaks of dumb dogs. Uh, with the poodle, our dog's not dumb. He's very, very intelligent. He's training us extremely well. Um, if you correct Kenosa, he turns sideways and itches his ear. So if you're on his case, he doesn't hear you. He doesn't hear you. He turns away and he doesn't listen. And then I give him treats when he goes out uh, to, to go potty. And now he's going out and faking it and running to me for the treats. So he's already, a, he's a sneaky dog, you know, he's no dummy uh, at all. But uh, this morning we're gonna talk about dumb dogs. And I'd like to just pray here in a moment, uh, but I'd like us to look at this memory text. We're trying to memorize basically a verse every two weeks from Isaiah from the preaching passages. And I'm just gonna comment on this text and then we'll pray and then we're gonna look at dumb dogs this morning. This verse, if you're memorizing it, one of the most important contexts you need to keep in mind is the even them refers back to Old Testament days where there were certain outcasts that were, were not permitted to join the people of God in their corporate worship. So there are certain classes of people that the Old Testament forbade from gathering together and worshiping, bringing their offerings, sacrifices unto the Lord. They just weren't included. So this text here is, is really a, a one of those promises that in the future, there will be no outcasts. Anyone who comes to the Lord uh, will be able to freely worship together our Savior. So even them will I bring to my holy mountain. That holy mountain is Jerusalem and Israel during the millennium. So these outcasts will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. So a group of people not typically known for their joy is now rejoicing in the Lord. And they're able now to bring their burnt offerings and their sacrifices. And notice it says, shall be accepted upon my altar. Oh, wow, if you're a eunuch in the Old Testament or if you were a Moabite or you were whatever that was forbidden to worship, you couldn't approach the altar. You couldn't bring a sacrifice. But now in the millennium, you're allowed to bring sacrifices as memorial offerings to reflect on the finished work of Christ on the cross, and then for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. And that goes back to just not only Jews and Gentiles, but even outcasts. All these believers will be included during the 1,000 year reign of Christ known as the millennium. So last two weeks ago, we ended the message, I mean, on millennial heights. And so in scripture, you have these two mountain peaks. You have the cross and you have Christ coming again to rule. And in between these two points is called the church age or the age of the Gentiles. And a lot of bad stuff happens between those two points. And we just happen now to be living in between them. 
And so we're living in some very challenging days. I don't envision them getting better, quite frankly. Uh, I don't think we will return to whatever you thought normal was. I don't want to discourage you, but realistically, I don't think we will return to normal. I think we're going to have to learn to adjust. And I'm so thankful that the gospel is designed by God for all ages, good or bad, difficult times and times of great liberty, but the gospel cannot be stopped. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church of our Savior. And so we can be extremely encouraged with the power of the gospel and God's ability to protect and sustain us during some challenging times. We look ahead to the future days as well when Christ comes. Well, let's pray and ask sort of bless our time around the theme of dumb, dumb dogs. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that this wonderful text we've just cited includes the outcasts, those who in the Old Testament context would be forbidden to worship with the people of God. We're so thankful that the gospel is so inclusive to, to anyone who comes to the cross by faith, for anyone who believes in their heart that God has raised your son from the grave and cries out in faith can be saved. We thank you that you're able to save to the uttermost. Lord, we're living in challenging days, and we don't have to tell you that, but we are experiencing things we've never experienced. We're seeing things we've never seen. And Lord, we're so glad that you know the future of all this. You know where this all ends up. But for us right now, there are times that we just seem to be running in, in, in the dark, and we know we need to trust you. So Lord, help us to trust you more. Sustain us through these times. May we make adjustments. May we learn how to best serve you in whatever conditions we're facing. May we always rejoice in our Lord. Thank you for this message and for this time together. Bless it, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. This morning, we're going to go from the heights of that millennial passage down to the, the now and now, the ugly, um, the ugly picture of a fallen world. Notice in verse 9 to the end of the chapter, you have a, a condition that's really quite desperate, very difficult to, to work through. And it begins with this invitation for wild animals to, to come out of the field or to come out of the forest and to attack. Notice the text, all ye beasts of the field, all of them. So whatever can come to your mind as a beast that has the capacity to devour it's now being commanded to come to do, do just that, to devour. So all, not just part of the beast, but all ye beasts of the field, come on. Come on and, and, and come to eat, devour, destroy. And if we don't get the message already in those two, two first phrases, it says again, yea, all ye beasts in the forest. So whatever lurks out there in the field, whatever's out there in the forest, anything with any degree of ferocity, come on and devour. So in our Colorado context, what would that be for us that we fear? What do we fear when it comes to wild animals, beasts in Colorado? How dangerous is our state? So this is my list. I'm going to take us from number 12 down to the most dangerous creature in the field or in the forest, or in our case, from the mountain. And I want you to look at these wild animals and what the author is saying here, all of them come out of the field and out of the forest and devour. And the context is, is that there is Israel here, Judah, and it's God saying to the wild animals, come on out and destroy Judah, the people of God, those who have an association with the name of God. And of course, this is figurative language that's being used. We got to figure out who are these beasts he's addressing to come and attack Israel. And what will Israel do if it's intact, if it's attacked? Will it be prepared? Will it be standing? Will it be ready? And we'll have those questions answered in just a moment. So let's go down my list. They may not be your list and in, and in the order. These are uh, some creatures that you might find in the field or in the forest. Uh, that, that little girl on the top left is a. Uh, is a black widow. May not kill you, but it could make your life a little unpleasant. That little thing on the right, a tick. 
I don't like ticks. I don't like them on me. I don't like them on my dog. But that tick can, can convey a, a disease called Lyme disease. My brother, six foot seven, monster of a man, had one little tick with Lyme disease and whittled him down. I mean, just took him out, it seemed like for years, just one little tick. And then uh, when you go into the garage and you get your shoes to go out to take your dog out, you may wanna shake the shoe a little bit because that, there might be in that, in that shoe a brown recluse spider. Now, all three of these probably aren't going to kill you, but, but they're number 12 in my list and they are here in Colorado. How about this guy here? That's an adorable looking cat. That, that's Bob's cat. That's a bobcat. Pretty quick, 25, 30 miles per hour. Probably not a threat. Probably not a threat. Unless you corner it. Um, I think it's a beautiful. I'm not a big cat person, but I like that cat. I wouldn't, wouldn't mind having a cat like that. This one doesn't threaten me. Probably doesn't threaten you. Uh, another category down to number 10 on my list of, of dangerous creatures. You go up Mount Evans and see that guy on the left. You go into uh, Dr. Pryor's house and see that guy on the right. You know, if you get stupid, play around, mess around, they can, they can take those horns and push you a little bit. They can do a little bit of damage, so be careful. Uh, but I'm not really threatened by them, but they're on my list. Let's go to number nine. This guy is a neighbor. This guy here, a little different than the bobcat, heavier, up to 55 pounds, uh, thick around the neck. So the difference between a bobcat and a number of differences, but there's just a, there's a girth to, to, to this guy. He lives right next to us in our, in our mountain home. And it's really neat because uh, cats, when they go, they go in a straight line. So coyotes and dogs, are, they're like this. But if it's a mountain lion, if it's a cat, if it's a bobcat, if it's a lynx, this guy's a lynx, it's a straight line, straight line. And it's neat, Elisa loves watching the tracks in the snow and there's a lot of hairs, um, fewer here, more there. And the, the lynx, you'll see this line following the rabbit trail and then the rabbit trail disappears. And you say, whoa, what happened? The lynx got them. And, and lynx um, usually go after rabbits and birds and deer. They're fast. We've chased this guy on a motorcycle at about 45 miles per hour. They're fast. They can do about 50 miles per hour. I'm not worried about the lynx. They're beautiful. They're going to probably run from you, but they, they can be potentially a threat, a beast in the woods or in the field or in the forest. Uh, these gentlemen here, you have to put on the list. They're big. You don't mess with those guys. Those horns are real. Uh, Elisa is a deer whisperer. She talks to all the deer. She knows them by first name. They come up and she can pet them. I mean that. We have one deer at our cabin that walks around the property following me like a dog. When I look into the eyes of that guy and see his, you know, four by four or five by five this year, I'm going to respect my distance and his, his distance because they can put a hurt into you. Those are some serious spears there on, on, the, on the muley and the, and the elk there. Now the next guy, I'm gonna watch him, maybe not alone. I'm not as worried just seeing one just gallivanting around here in their open, open range. But I tell you what, we have friends and family where they'll do their damage. They'll do damage to your, your, your pets. But, it, but in the winter, especially when they hunt in large packs, you don't want this thing circling around you and all of his friends. Uh, we saw a kill near our cabin and they start howling and they're inviting all their buddies to show up for a meal. You should see them fly. These guys from 35 to 43 miles per hour will get there in a heartbeat for a good meal. And so you're not out running any of these creatures. Um, so the coyotes makes me a little nervous. This guy makes me more nervous. This guy in the, in the field or in the forest, uh, they say we don't have wolves here. That's not true. We've seen two wolves very close to our cabin, one just right down the hill. Our boy saw maybe 500 yards from the house, a pretty good sized wolf. Wolves can range the male up to 180 pounds, their speed 31 to 37 miles per hour. You're not gonna outrun it. And uh, that, that guy's, they are here, they are here. He's on my list. 
Uh, a guy maybe not above a, a certain elevation in our state, but one you need to look out for in the forest. We only have one venomous snake in our state, but he's got to be on the list. Up in Wyoming, we call the trail from the Camp Grace down to the north part of the Laramie River, we call that Rattlesnake Trail. And they're there. You got to be careful. Occasionally, you hear folks getting bit by a rattlesnake. Maybe not deadly in all cases, but you got to be careful. And then the next guy on my list, we're getting down to some of the more serious predators, these beasts in the, in the, in the field or in the forest. Uh, this guy, they say there's only 300 of them in our country. I think there's far more than 300. Um, Jim saw this guy hunting here in, in, in up, up, uh, up in the hunt unit 371. Uh, my wife and I saw this guy at my parents' farm. I thought, it, I didn't know what it was at first. I had to look it up. I had to look it up. We went in and Googled animals and finally said that, that's what it is. That's the Wolverine. They are here. There may only be one, but that guy is here. Jim saw it at our, our farm in New York. We saw it. I think there's more than 300 of them in our country. And these are some, these are some lean, mean fighting machines. Uh, these beasts, when they come out of the field or in the wood, they can kill livestock, small animals, and they've even been known to kill even smaller moose. Their nickname is the mountain devil, the mountain devil. And so when we get to this text in Isaiah, there's all the beasts of the field and all the beasts of the forest come to devour. This guy could put a hurting on you. Just look at him. Wow, very impressive. This next creature is probably the one we fear the most, at least at our cabin. Again, <laughs> we had our grandson and granddaughter with us last week. We went up to, for a day trip. I got on the four wheel. I said, Bennett, we're gonna go find mountain lion tra tracks. We're gonna track mountain lions. They said, let's do it, pop, pop. So we got on the four wheeler and uh, there's a whole bunch of deer crossing on multiple places on those dirt roads up there. And behind those tracks of the deer, you'll see that singular line of the cat. And with the mountain lion, their, their prints, they have like a camelback, little two little humps inside of their paw. And I said, Bennett, do you see it? Look at the size of that. And so we got on the, on the trail of a mountain lion. And he got a little nervous. He said, Pop up, do you have a gun? No, we don't have a gun. We got the four wheeler. We got the four wheeler. And uh, that wasn't very convincing because these guys can go up to 50 miles per hour. And they're here. They're here. So that guy, imagine that guy coming out of the woods or out of the field or out of the forest and, and attacking. Uh, the next one in my list as we get to the, the big boys is this guy here. You know what that is. Look at the way he's built his back. That's not a black bear. That's a brown bear. That's a grizzly. They say the grizzly is extinct in Colorado since 1953. That is not true. That is not true. Uh, there's one north of us above Wellington, Fort Collins. There is one up there, Jim Solid. Got a picture of it. it. It is a grizzly. It's a grizzly. He may be roaming, but there's a grizzly. If you see a, a grizzly, you play dead. If you see a black bear, you fight back. You ask, how in the world do you stop something like this from charging? You take away its credit card. And that's one way to do it. That's one way to do it. Uh, we fear the bear. We have 11 different identified bear on our property. 11. That's just when we're there. That's just when we're there. It's not counting other bear that is kind of cruising through our property. 11 different bear. We have junkyard bears. We got other bears. We have them all. We name them after people we don't like. <laughs> don't ask me. Don't even ask. Don't even ask. They all have names. They all have names. But uh, the last time some, a person was killed in Colorado by a bear was 12 years ago. But uh, they intimidate you. They intimidate you. Believe me, they intimidate you. Well, they say this guy here may be the most dangerous guy. I think there's one worse. This guy weighs up to 1,200 pounds. He goes, uh, runs at about 30 miles per hour. Put it in perspective, a horse can do 50, 55. So all these creatures are fast. They are all powerful. This guy's... Uh, Sight isn't real good, that, that's an advantage. You can hide maybe behind a tree. Uh, but if you see this guy stop, stopping his eating, and begins to stare at you, if his ears begin to lay back, if the hair begins to rise on his hump or neck, 
uh, if he lowers his head and begins walking towards you, smacking his lips and clicking his teeth and saying, yum, yum, he's coming after you. And you better get out of his way. When you're in the mountains and these guys walk down and are eating, they sound like a bulldozer. How many of you guys have hunted and you've been out in the woods and the moose come right by? I've had three moose come by me as close as that piano to this pulpit. John and I are eating our lunch together and a moose just walks right by with his hoof, breaks the ice and, and drinks and just does his thing. Beautiful animals. But uh, don't let that... Uh, uh, don't underestimate this guy. This guy may be the king, king of the mountains. But there's one other animal. If you've been thinking which animals you would be most intimidated by, this guy here is, I think, the most dangerous creature in Colorado. Maybe in the West. And you're thinking, okay, what's left? I think this guy, and it's not humans. <laughs> it's not skip and I hunting, which is pretty dangerous. It's the pika. The pika. He's the piranha of the mountains. You see his mouth? He's crying for help. If you're in the mountains and a pika does that, hundreds, thousands of pikas come to you and they jump all over you and eat you up like piranhas. They are the piranhas, they call them, of the mountains. Dozens of fatalities every year due to pika attacks. This is ridiculous. <laughs> this is not true for those who are buying into this and you're taking deep notes on this deep sermon. But there are animals, there are creatures, there are, are all kinds of beasts in the field. And I'm going to a lot of length of time on this point because it's fun, but I think it really illustrates the point, all of them, whatever you have in your mind as a ferocious wild animal that can destroy, devour, whatever came to your mind, whatever pictures you just saw, God is saying, all of you come out of the field, all of you beasts in the forest, not just some of you, all of you come. Bring it on and devour. Now, I would say those beasts likely represent, yes, foreign entities. I think that's true. I think that's accurate. Gentile powers. Perhaps it was Assyria as the beast that came and destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel. Perhaps it's the, 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 maybe it was Babylon in view here for the beasts that came out of the forest to destroy Judah. The point is, these are very, very powerful entities that can do it. They can devour. So let's just stop here for a moment. Here's Israel being described where they're going to be attacked. Now, how will the leadership respond to these beasts, to these foreign entities? And then let's just take it another step. Right now, who are our enemies as Americans, political enemies? Would you list China first, Russia second, whatever, Iran, Northern Korea, what, what's your list, whatever it may be, add, add whatever foreign entities. And, and what we have here is, is, are we ready as a nation if we're attacked, whether from within or without, are we ready? And probably more germane to our purposes of worship, and as I speak to us as believers this morning, are we ready to stand against a, a very fierce foe, a lion known as the devil? We see in the scriptures that we're in a spiritual battle personally. We're fighting against a ferocious enemy, but we can have the right equipment, the right garments, the right clothing, the right armor, as the Bible describes it, to stand against a ferocious roaring lion. And this, this lion is governing a world system which is described as the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and pride of life. This is describing a system that is antagonistic and hateful of God, hateful of the people of God, hateful of anything that's right, upright, and holy. And there is a war going on, and then we have our own battle within. If it's not hard enough without, we are battling our sinful fallen nature called the flesh. And so we're in this enormous battle right now. And what we look at nationally and internationally, we say, wow, we've never seen these combinations and whatever we see going on right now, we, we're trying to discern it and trying to figure it out. And then all I can say at the root of it is we are in a spiritual war more than ever. 
And so we have here these various attacks. Now watch the context of this passage. So there are enemies that are going to come and they're going to attack Israel. Now, will they be ready? Will their leaders be ready? Which leads us to verse 10. So listen carefully to the text. It says here, his watchmen are blind, referring to Israel. They're watchmen. They're those who should be standing guard, those who should be alert, those who should be circumspect, those who should see it all, they're blind. And not only are they blind, they're ignorant. They don't have a clue. And what happens with most of us here as we grow in our Christian walk and in our love for the Lord and his word, as we get older in the Lord and we look around us, we see a lot of, a lot of incompetency. We see it in churches. That's sad. But uh, we often see it politically where you say, you know what, I, have more, I would have more confidence in my grandson Jack governing in some of these positions than the people we have in place. I'd rather my 10-year-old who's, who knows the Lord and knows that the Bible should be the basis for our worldview, I'd rather have him governing than others, a 10-year-old. Because we have folks who are, who are blind, who should be watching. And, and then they're ignorant. So this, this text begins to help me work through what we're going through in America right now, and Israel's, America's not Israel, and Israel's not America, I get that. But how do, you, how do you work through, how do you get your arms around circumstances where, where you're looking at leadership and you're saying, they don't have a clue? May I encourage you, this is nothing new. Nothing new. Uh, I like the three blind mice there, <laughs> you know. We've got the three blind mice in many positions running this country, the three blind mice. I remember years ago, it was funny, in college, I was pitching against Millersville State College University in Pennsylvania. I had a good game, actually. It was a, I had a no-hitter going into the eighth inning. I told my coach, and I didn't have to tell him, everyone knew I was running out of gas, and, but I, didn't, I wasn't going to come out. But I did say, Coach, um, you know, we got an eight-run eight lead. We got an eight-run lead. I like to stay in, but if I, if I give up a hit and give up a run or so, you probably want to take me out. Let's just get this W. And in the eighth inning, everything fell apart. I gave up my first hit, and then they scored a couple runs. And then um, the tying run or the winning run was coming around third, and uh, there was a play at the plate. We hit our relay points. The throw was made to home base, and uh, it looked like our catcher got it and put the tag on to preserve our lead. And uh, the umpire thought differently, and uh, he called him safe. Well, my coach, likely a Christian man, good man, I never heard him cuss. He was only angry three times in the four or five years I knew him, and all three times related to me. This was one of them. He made a beeline to the, to the home plate, and he asked the umpires to come together, first base, third base, and the home plate up. And he looked at those guys and he said, you three men are the three blind mice. You can't see a thing. And then I added my expletives. And then Coach Wright and I, were, we were ex escorted out of the stadium. So I, he was never thrown out of a game in the history of his 40 plus years of coaching, except with wheel. So um, his watchmen, the umpires, the leaders, they are blind so when we're trying to assess America in 2021, I think there's a lot of leaders, quite frankly, that are blind, spiritually blind, and they're not alert, and they're not, they're not looking at the enemy. I don't think they have the capacity to, perhaps. There's, these leaders are called ignorant. Notice the next phrase, let the, you know, the next text parallel, Matthew 15, where Jesus says, fascinating, let them alone. Jesus is saying to his followers, let them alone. Leave those leaders alone, those Pharisees, those blind leaders. Leave them alone. Just leave them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And then he says, and if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. And the impression is, okay, I'm going to send you guys out 
to a nation where the leaders are blind, they're leading people astray, and the leaders may not listen to you. And, and I'll give them that he's going to give them a message. Believe me, Matthew 23 is his message to them. Maybe it woke up some of them, maybe. You don't hear of one Sadducee saved in the whole New Testament. Not one Sadducee, the liberal uh, theologian and politician, not one of them saved in the whole New Testament. Can Jesus save a liberal you know, politician? Yes, he can. He can save a, you know, a, a, a John Newton. We sang the song he wrote, a converted slave trader. He can do it. But it's almost the, the emphasis, okay, let them alone, the leaders there, and go after the, the blind followers. Get the word of God out to the people. Because if they don't get off this track, they're going to be led into a ditch. And right now, I was talking to my son, John. We were talking about different approaches to doing life in America in 2021. I'm saying, son, the focus has got to be on prayer for our leadership. It has to be. And it has to be on the gospel. Other plans can be subordinate to that, but we cannot lose sight of the gospel because they're spiritually blind. The only hope is for God to open their eyes and for them to know Jesus. It's the gospel that will change their life in our country. But I'll tell you what, if, if the blind are leading, and they are, and people do not hear the gospel that are following, they're all going to end up in a ditch. So what does America look like? We end up in a ditch. That might be an economic disaster ditch, maybe an international military war disaster ditch, maybe a spiritual disaster, a health pandemic, a social disaster, a ditch that people run into. So we have, a, we, have a, we, have a, we have a mandate. We've got to go out and get the gospel out. That's our message. And the gospel is designed for any time period. It's not, this is not the time to say, oh, poor us as Christians in America, we're going to put this aside and, and, and get something else as our focus. No, Christ must remain the focus in the gospel of Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. And uh, there's a long history of incompetent leaders and we may see some of the most incompetent leaders we, that we've ever seen in our life. Because if you understand the biblical eschatology, things are to get worse. And a, there's going to be a leadership vacuum created in the world where a, a, a person called the Antichrist can step in the vacuum to be a one-world leader. And for that to happen, you can't have strong leaders because strong leaders are going to say, no, we're going to say no to the borders. We're going to keep our borders. We're going to keep our national distinctions. We're not going down those roads. But when you have weak leaders, they play into it. They play into a big play. And that spirit of Antichrist is at work as we speak. So these incompetent leaders, they are blind and they're ignorant. And then they're called three different things. Let's look at it. They're called dumb dogs. And you don't need to go on Facebook this afternoon and list all your political foes and call them dumb dogs. I'm not asking you to do that, okay? And if, if you do, please don't say Pastor Sen said, please post that all of our political leaders are dumb dogs, okay? But they're all dumb dogs. They are all dumb dogs in the context of Isaiah's writing. Dumb dogs. They cannot bark. Sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. And I had a video, and I'm too stupid to figure out how to... And, and put the video into my slides. Maybe someone can help me do that. I know it's probably not difficult. But just watch the video. Watch the video. Do you see it? There's a dog. Think of a guy wearing a mask, breaking through the door, coming into your house, to your safe. Do you see it? Do you see what the dog's doing? Nothing. Now, your house is, you have an intruder in your house. They're going to take away something, and your dumb dog <laughs> is sleeping. 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 So this is a picture. Here is a nation that's going to be attacked from the beasts of the field, the beasts of the forest. These are serious creatures. They're going to come and devour, and the leadership, are they ready for an, an international war? Are they ready for an outside invasion? Are you kidding? They're asleep at the wheel. And I am afraid we have folks that, are, that have no clue and no discernment, and, and spiritually speaking, they're asleep, and they love it. They love it. They don't even know there's a threat. They don't even know that they're the threat. They have no clue. They're blind. They're ignorant. They're dumb dogs, and they don't bark. 
they don't warn you of the enemy because they're in bed with the enemy. They don't, they don't bark when the enemy's coming because they're in cahoots with the enemy. You know what I'm saying? So they're dumb dogs. They, they're not going to bark. They're not going to warn you. So what's that mean? That means the enemy is going to come in like a storm, like a stream. And guess who gets taken out? Guess who, who pays the price when leadership isn't awake at the wheel? So they're called dumb dogs, okay? They're also called greedy dogs, greedy dogs. So they're dumb and they're greedy. They don't warn. You think about, you think of, you know, all the examples. Man, I could preach the rest of the morning and the afternoon on all the political leaders who are sleeping at the helm and aren't warning. My folks live in New York State. New York really is two states. You have New York City and you have the rest of the state, <laughs> okay? And the rest of the state pays for the sins of New York City. And uh, they have a governor who did not warn their state properly and yet wants to take all the credit in the world for being this incredible leader when he is sending by the thousands infected COVID patients into nursing homes where people were healthy, but when you bring the mix together, now you have people without COVID getting COVID and dying by the thousands. And then covering it up, no warning. Rather than warning, be complicit to, to the death of some of our dear old folks. Are you kidding? My folks live in upstate New York in the Finger Lakes. They're doing well, they're alive, I'm so thankful. But I tell you what, if they were not doing so well and they were in a nursing home or senior care unit in New York City and that governor released patients with COVID into, that, into those units of my healthy parents, can you imagine the battle people have today, the anger, the bitterness, the resentment, knowing that that could have been prevented and you didn't do anything about it, you didn't warn, and you had the audacity to take credit for being such a great governor and leader? Are you kidding? For China to release this pandemic and not warn the world for days to save face or to use it as a, a weapon for their political gain? Are you kidding? To have health organizations that don't warn? You get it. What about the greediness? I tell you what, all of us are probably in the wrong field. The money in the, is in the politics. The money's in the politics. The greedy dogs, they can never have enough. These are the leaders. They are, they're in it for the money. So you say, I don't get what's going on in America. Yeah, you can get it. They're blind. They're ignorant. They're asleep at the wheel. They're not protecting the people. They're, they're dumb. They're greedy. Now, I don't know if any of these folks are greedy. I don't know their hearts. But, but just looking at the net worth of those in Congress, who is not a multimillionaire? Who is not a multimillionaire? Mark Warner from Virginia, net worth $214 million. You can do a lot with $214 million. You can buy an office. Nancy Pelosi is the Speaker of the House, $114 million net worth. And I'm not jealous of that. I'm not competing for that, but that's a lot of money. And it's, this isn't just a Democrat thing. You know, Feinstein, $87.9 million. But what about Mitch McConnell at $34 million net worth? And you look at these lifetime politicians and you look at their salaries, their base salaries, that money doesn't add up to these figures. That's a lot of book sales, you could say, or a lot of speaking engagements. Well, okay, I sell books. I lose money on books. Well, they're selling more books. Okay, maybe that's true. You make $1 per book. You make $1 per book in the book world, unless you negotiate a little better deal. It's usually $1. Liz, up north of us, Wyoming, $14 million net worth. $14 million. Hillary, how in the world did you accumulate $111 million? How did you do that? President Obama, your salary was only $400,000 for eight years. How did you accrue out of nowhere $70 million of net worth? Where are you guys getting the money? What are you doing behind closed doors? Where are you getting all this money? What, who's in, who's, who's complicit to all this? Are you kidding? 
Our own governor, I'm not begrudging him of his $313 million. I'm not begrudging him of that. He's one of the wealthiest politicians in the country. $313 million. So I'm thinking of people who, some may be in it for the money, maybe, do you think? The tendency here, Isaiah is saying they're all this way. I'm not saying all these are that way, but, but you're seeing the bent of fallen nature. Now I'm thinking, okay, they're blind, they need the gospel. I really do pray for our governor and, and the first gentleman, uh, Reese. I do pray for them. I was thinking of a, a way to witness to him, actually. His, uh, his first adopted child is Caspian. Caspian. And uh, how would you witness? You know, probably if I had a chance, I'm, I'm praying about setting up an appointment with our governor to talk with him, given the perspective of Christians in the church and Baptists in particular in our state, his state and our state. And I thought, you know, what would be a touch, a point of warmth? Where can I connect with? Well, I know for me, I love talking about my kids. <laughs> He's got two adopted kids, Caspian. You know, perhaps I could get him, you know, C.S. Lewis's book, you know, called Prince Caspian. Great story. Maybe I get a leather-bound Prince Caspian from the read uh, to read. Maybe a gift and, and win him there. His his daughter, uh, her middle name is Baruka. First name's Cora. Cora Baruka. Some of us who have enough Hebrew background, we know that that's Hebrew. He comes from a Hebrew lineage. So our governor is a Jew. He changed his name because he got into some problems. <laughs> so he had to change his name. But uh, Baruka, I like that. It means blessing in Hebrew. Love to talk about his adopted daughter and what a blessing I'm sure she is. I, I think there's ways to get the gospel to people. I don't want to polarize my mission field. But I see this text. They're dumb dogs. They're greedy dogs which can never have enough. And then they're called shepherds that cannot understand. And then it comes back to their self-centeredness, their selfishness. They all look to their own way. So these politicians Isaiah is speaking about are, are, are not doing their job. It's all about the money. It's all about themselves. And they're going to do whatever they can to protect themselves. And they're going to exploit people. We pay for their habits. <laughs> they're getting rich off of us, the people. I hope you understand that. For, and everyone for his gain. They're in for the money from his quarter. Wow, very interesting. And then the next, the next line of thoughts, a very interesting statement by Isaiah. Let's look at it here. Not only are they dumb dogs, greedy dogs, and undiscerning, selfish shepherds, they're people who like the party. And this is fascinating when you see the context of all this. Again, a second imperative in the pack, pack, pass it, package here. Come, you say. Come, you say they. I'll fetch wine. And we will fill ourselves with strong drink. These political leaders Isaiah is talking about, they're in it for themselves. It's all about the money. It's all about pleasure. Life's just a big party. And it almost has the flavor of a, a frat house or a sorority where, hey, let's just get a keg and let's get some whiskey and let's just party it up. And this isn't anything new. Our founding fathers, have you ever seen the tab that they spent on alcohol when they were doing a little signing of some documents in Philadelphia? This is not new, the alcohol issue of politicians. Not all of them are this way, thankfully. But here, it's all about fun and getting drunk in our context, getting high on marijuana, doing the cocaine, whatever drugs of choice we see today. These are partiers. These are country club people. This isn't about you, America, first. This is about living high on the hog, and life's one big party. And today's a party, and tomorrow shall be as this day. This is a party. Tomorrow's a party. In fact, tomorrow's going to be even a bigger party. You say, wow, what a sad life. What a sad life. These parties are illustrations of a human heart longing for something that, that satisfies, and they ain't getting it. Because we have a vacuum in our heart that only God can fill, and alcohol won't fill it, and drugs won't fill it, and sex won't fill it, money won't fill it. Only God can fill it. It's what a sad story. So these are indulgent losers. Now, let's conclude here with, with an observation. We had started this message on the, on the mountaintop, literally in Jerusalem in the millennium, where outcasts are coming in to be of the Lord and offering sacrifices, worshiping God. And now we're talking about 
incompetent losers leading the people. What's the context? At least one application would be this. Look at this text. 2 Kings 21 tells us the sad story. Please get this. Hezekiah is a really good king. He loves the Lord. He has fought hard for, for national purity. He, he, he cherishes life. It's all about Yahweh, all about, all about God. He gets sick, you might remember, and he almost dies, and he prays, and God extends his life by how many years? 15 years. And guess who's born in that 15-year window? A boy by the name of Manasseh. Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign. Now, I think there's a great place for term limits, two years and four years and six years. Notice his term limit. He served 55 years. Well, that's great if you have a Reagan for 55 years, but what if you have a Manasseh for just four years or for eight years? This man, in days and weeks and months after his dad's death, will turn the country upside down. One change at the top. In days and weeks, all of the hard work of Hezekiah, fighting against human nature, fighting against the flesh, fighting against outside attacks, a man who built a nation, was going in a good direction. And the next guy, his son, undermines everything he did with just a sweep of a pen. Can you imagine? Some of us right now, we love our country so much, we're knowledgeable. We study it. We learn it. We watch it. We pray for it. And we see some trends. Wow, some neat things that maybe in the last few years, whatever, we were encouraged by. And then within days, weeks, all of that we cheered on and rejoiced in is like turned up on its head. You're saying, how can this be? Look what this guy did. He did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. This is the thing. When we talk about politics, it's not just man to man, mano to mano. We're talking about what does God think about this? That's important, don't you think? To the creator as he watches the nations, watches ours. If we do evil, that, you don't think that gets God's attention? Sure it does. So sure enough, this guy comes in and he built up again the high places which Hezekiah, his father, had destroyed. His dad was doing right. And the son comes in and puts all this idolatry back in place to Baal. He makes a grove as Ahab did. Oh, wow, that's, that's significant. He worshiped all the hosts of heaven and served them, and he built altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord said in Jerusalem, will I put my name? And look at verse 5. Are you kidding? He builds multiple altars for the host of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord? Are you kidding? This guy just destroyed monotheistic worship of the one true God. He has just imported every junk thing you can imagine into the, into the temple. This is, this is very intrusive, very invasive. And I think maybe the thing that really breaks our heart is what he does next in verse 6. And this breaks my heart as I look at America today. This man made his son pass through the fire. Manasseh took a son that he gave life to. He took that son and he offered it really to Satan on an altar where that son was burnt to a crisp, a living son burnt to a crisp. Folks, that's really sick. That is so demonic. That is so satanic. Satan is a murderer from the beginning. That is so evil. He had no respect for life. And when you have leaders that do not have a respect for the sanctity of life and the life of a little one in the womb, just say, woe unto that nation. God's justice will not sleep forever. He made his son pass through the fire. Look at, look at the context. You know, it's with enchantments and familiar spirits and wizards. This is occultic. This is occult practices. And he wrought much wickedness in the sight of the Lord. He's watching every bit of this. Every bit of this. How sad, how sad, how sad. 
In recent days, some of the saddest things I've watched is a new administration will include in their Affordable Care Act monies to cover abortion. Roe v. Wade will not have any hope to be changed or altered. There will be efforts to stop state restrictions on abortion. There will be monies restored to Planned Parenthood. And this nation will fund abortion within, the, within its country, its, its parameters. And we will fund abortion around the world. And guess what? Your tax dollars are funding it. And the Lord sees it. And it provokes them to anger. Provokes them to anger. And that's where we are. Now you say, okay, this, you, Colin kind of hinted, you, it's going to be a discouraging message. So you're saying, okay, this sounds real familiar. It's real familiar. Is this, is this parallel or current? Man, this is current. So how's this all end? So let me really encourage you. How does it end when there's a Hezekiah who's pro-life, who's trying to build a, a country for the people, for the glory of God, and then you have the next guy come in and turns it all on its head? What's the good news? Well, the good news is this paragraph ends in verses 1 and 2 of the next chapter. So we'll just come finish. Here's the good news. The righteous perish. Amen? You die. And the merciful men are taken away. You die. Isn't that a blessing? When you go from Hezekiah to Manasseh, who has an all-out powerhouse, an all-out power play, where he controls, let's say, the, the Senate and the House and the, and the CEO office. He controls it all. You die. And guess what? And no man lays it to heart. They could care less. They could care less. Because we are viewed as so radical and so right and so weird the Christian, get rid of them. They're the problem. They're the problem. It's the Christian that's the problem. If we're going to have unity in our country, get, get rid of the Christian. And when they die, and their pastors die, and their people die, good riddance. It's good. Who cares? Who cares? None considering that the righteous is taken away from the evil to come. It's no big deal. So what a blessing this is. You say, are you kidding? No, I'm not kidding. This is what happened. Let me read to you what the Pharisee Josephus wrote about Manasseh. So Josephus lives in the first century. He knows Jesus. He writes of Jesus. He's writing of the history of the Jews, the antiquities of Israel. Listen to these words. Josephus writes, Manasseh was so hardy as to defile the temple of God and the city and the whole country. So he defiled the whole country. And then he says, by setting out from a contempt of God, his problem, he had a contempt for God. He hated God. He despised God. He barbarously slew all the righteous men that were among the Hebrews. So if you're righteous, you perish. You are merciful, you're taken away. And then he says in his book, nor would Manasseh spare the prophets. So who's living in the day of Manasseh? What prophet is alive? It's this man, Isaiah. This is sad. Hezekiah's own son, Manasseh, is going to cut Isaiah in half, sawn asunder by this guy. And then he says, for every day he slew some of them, Till Jerusalem was overrun with blood. He liked it. He looked for the righteous man. He looked for the righteous woman and brought them into his presence and had them killed. Bloodshed. Wow, the death of the righteous. And then the paragraph ends. Here's the blessing for us <laughs> He shall enter into peace. He, the righteous person who's been killed, shall enter into peace. Rest in peace. R.I.P. Put it on the tomb. And they shall rest in their beds. And these beds are not queen size, nor are they king size, nor are they twins. This is your grave. The righteous shall enter into peace. They shall rest in their beds. Each one walking in his uprightness. Literally, those who walked, past tense, those who walk in uprightness, those who, are, who live godly, they suffered this kind of perse persecution where they were put to death. 
And when I say we may not get back to the old normal, I doubt if we will. What if this is the new normal in five years, in 10 years? I'll tell you what it's going to do. There's going to be some purging. The real Christians, we'll see who they are. We'll see who they are. And I tell you what, when the church is shedding blood, it grows. And I'm not encouraging it, and I'm not praying for it, and I'm not desiring it. But it was the blood of the martyrs. It was their seed which produced an enormous movement of the gospel. And the gospel can stand in the worst days of persecution. And our nation has never seen what is being described here. But do you realize when you look at the map around the world on persecution of Christians, have you ever looked outside of our 50 states and see what's happening to Christians all over the world? Folks, there is a, a, a boa constrictor choking Christians, and we're last. We're last. But if the Lord tarries, we could be next. We could be next. And so we may not go back to the old normal. We may have to look at these principles. We must look perhaps at the prophecies and where it all fits together. And we may have to get on our knees and pray a, bit, a little bit more. And we're going to have to have, maybe, maybe tweak our strategies. How do, you, how do you live? How do you do Christian living in a time when you are so hated and you're being hunted? You say, that sounds so crazy and so radical. Is it? Is it? They shall enter into peace. They shall rest in the beds. Those who walked in the uprightness. Let's pray for our country.